And we are live and recording. You're probably watching this later, so it might not be live for you, but we are live. We are live. And, uh, I feel alive. <laughs> you look alive. You look very healthy. You have a nice glow. Good, good. good. Well, it is five, right? So, and the holiday. That's, so, that's true. That's true. Much to be thankful yeah. for. So, uh, I want to just welcome, uh, for those of you watching the video, this is. Um, a uh, weekly broadcast, which actually sometimes is more than weekly, of uh, uh, a new show that we created called Solutionaries. It's one of the uh, enterprises and projects of the Earth Stock Foundation. And I'm really happy to be here today uh, to do this interview, not only with an amazing solutionary doer and friend, but also uh, just a really great person. And it's nice to uh, share the fact that we are working on some really big issues and also the fact that we can share some laughs and giggles. So I want to introduce the Solutionaries, Heidi Petty, who is the Watershed Program Manager for the Contra Costa Resource Conservation District. So welcome. Good job. Yeah, that's a hard one. It's a mouthful, trust me. I've been saying it for uh, almost 15 years in January, 15 years in January, and still wow. I stumble on it. <laughs> it's wow. a lot of words. It's a ton of words. It's a lot so, of words, and, and it's a lot of work, you. I'm sure, right? It is, the words it is, but parallel. it's the work. Good. So, uh, <laughs> try, try, try write try. a paragraph about yourself. <laughs> <with that. laughs> and then say it five times <laughs> quick. So right. uh, well, you put your hand on your nose. Uh, so it looks it looks really cozy there. I think you're uh, zooming in from some undisclosed secret base in the Delta. Is that correct? That is right. Cool. I am in the San Francisco Delta. Uh, Fantastic. Trying to stay warm in my little cabin. So, but uh, it's pretty cozy. So I'm feeling pretty. I've got my gloves on. I've got my scarf on. I have my ethanol heater going, so my little fake fire is working, so I'm happy. <laughs> nice, nice. And, and it's great because uh, not only are you doing some amazing work, but we, we met recently when we were uh, working with um, Bob Saunders on what we're calling the Sacramento River Watershed Project, which is to uh, educate the general public and bring more awareness about issues of privatization, mismanagement, and of course, uh, environmental toxins. So we got the uh, honor and privilege to meet you and find out more about your work. And that's what today is really about. So why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about the work that you do in Contra Costa and, and how did you get involved in that? Because obviously it's a very specialistic uh, area of work. Um, yeah. So and, and enlighten us with your, ama your amazing uh, <laughs> my project. Silly tale. My silly tale of how I got here. Um, yeah. Let's see, like I said, I will be at the Resource Conservation District for 15 years coming in January. Almost, almost, uh, I don't know, almost a lot of my life. I think at this point, I feel like all my life to a certain extent. Uh, how do I get into it? I actually, my degree is in neurology and cognition. So strangely enough, not anything to do with water. Um, but to do with people and thinking and feelings and all that good stuff. And um, I, instead of going to my PhD, decided I was going to have two children. So I had two children, um, which apparently having two children 15 months apart was not enough work for me. So I started doing bonsais and saltwater reef tanks. Uh, and I just had like, I don't even know, 500 gallons of reef tank in my house and my yard was all trees and yeah, I was getting kind of crazy. And one day I was walking with my son and I saw this little shop and I went, you know what? I guess I'll just rent this shop and sell some of this stuff. So I started doing these, um, what I called living arts. So I did these little artists, uh, not really artists so much as I considered an art, but it was the idea of using uh, natural entities to clean your water. So as opposed to going in and adding like all of these different chemicals, I literally created 24 inches of salt water, lights, uh, critters, you know, shrimp, bugs, the right fish, uh, fish that were only supposed to be in this much habitat. Um, so I just started creating these natural systems, which had not really been done in the saltwater world. It was very much like, um, how many chemicals can we put in it to unbalance this water, to rebalance the water? So I had done this whole different thing and uh, became the chamber president because of it um, and did that for four years, I think four and a half years, and then became 
the bona fide mayor of a couple of small towns uh, from that and decided maybe, you know, I was getting bored again and decided to go back to work. So somebody on one of my boards had said, hey, you would be perfect for this job at the Resource Conservation District. You know all about water quality. You know all about natural systems. You know the politics of the community. Uh, go apply. So I was like, well, you, you know, you need a degree in natural resources and all of these things like upper you know, level degrees. And I went, you know, whatever, I'll go see this. This is a cool place. Um, and I went in, they hired me amazingly enough. And they said, you are qualified. You've got this. So I took all of my random world knowledge and water knowledge. And I'd always been kind of an environmentalist, a volunteer, creek cleanups, all of that um, community stuff. And uh, they asked me to do this and I'll actually show our webpage. So here, let's see if I can, oh, I have to, I have to, ask you to share my web page, dear. Oh, well, we'll, we'll try that here. Yeah, I think you, if you make me a co-host. Okay. Getting pretty good at Zoom things. Yeah, I'll make you a co-host here. So well, what a fascinating story, because like you said, there is there's a such thing, what they call experiential education or experiential degrees right yep. now. And yep. uh, so it's amazing that you had this background. I'm just going to make you the host for the moment here. It'll be okay. easier and quicker for the broadcast. And uh, you should be able to, I did, you should be able to share a screen. Yeah, so, so what is, what is, um, so this is us. This is my life now. <laughs> the mission of, uh, you are little, you are literally going with the flow. I'm literally going with the flow. I literally live on the flow now. I go with the flow. My home is on the river. I have a marina with docks and water. And, um, and, and really my mission in life is just the same mission as Contra Costa Resource Conservation District, which is to find a way to facilitate conservation, to, to have people understand the importance of the natural resources in their area, to have them realize how important it is to value their water, uh, and it's just really uh, going into a community and going, what does this community need to understand the importance of water? Sometimes that's uh, very educated communities where I just go in and do large shoreline projects, um, work on toxicity sites, um, cleanups. Sometimes it's just base level, teach the kids, you know, go in, show the kids how to do what the kids need to do to be good stewards of the land. So um, for me, it leaves me open to this kind of um, use of your whole personality, you know, mm -hmm. all of the different things that I'm good at come into play in different ways, you know, being, I can be political, I can be a mom, I can go into the kid's classroom and teach them what a watershed is, do this with my hands and explain watersheds. Um, or I can just put on, I literally have hip waders and go out in creeks and we do water quality, uh, find out what's going on with the creek, try to find out how to stop what's going on with the creek if it's something bad, um, just about everything. So uh, that's kind of oddly, a, it's a, it seems like a lot, but it works, it works well in the end. It works really well. So that's, that's what I do. So, so it's uh, amazing because it's uh, obviously multifaceted. You don't do one specific thing, but the thing about bringing awareness to water, which is interesting because, as you know, uh, the California Delta, the, the Sacramento River Delta, where, where three watersheds meet is, is really a huge, important uh, cornerstone to California's water security. And, you know, I know in our work here to the north from Mount Shasta through the basin, uh, the Sacramento River Basin mm -hmm. all the way on to, to, well, at least to Sacramento and the Delta, and then meeting you and the work that you're doing in Contra Costa, you know, there's a lot right. of things that are affecting uh, water, you know, uh, last, well, at the beginning of this year, they turned water now into a, a commodity on the Chicago Exchange, so it's now one of the hottest I traded know. commodities, so, you know, the, I know there's an issue of privatization, and we're not going to get into that in discussion, but I think it is fascinating, um, the whole idea of water and water mediation and water cleanup, which really starts with someone's own personal responsibility. And then how do we become more of a, uh, a water advocate or maybe even a water activist to actually get out and do things, be part of this, you know, I know this is a big word we talk about, be part of the solution and stop contributing to the problem. So yeah, um, and, yeah. and, I mean, that's uh, the biggest thing, right? And absolutely. The thing. So, so, 
what are the, if you could just kind of riff off a little bit, there, there's multiple watersheds that meet in the Delta. And of course the Delta is one of the largest uh, estuaries in the world. And it's crucial to, you know, California, the Pacific fish population. It's crucial to agriculture. It's crucial to uh, development. I mean, it, 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 there's so many aspects to it, but just kind of riff off, what are the watersheds that meet there? And then what do, what do you find in Contra Costa that, you know, are some, what are some of the big issues? Is it climate change? Is it just, is it farm runoff? You know, what are the, is it just trash? You know, what is contributing yeah. to this huge problem of water toxicity? And I think all, like all of those things really. So, you know, for example, th this is such an interesting area. So Contra Costa County has uh, East County where I am right now, right on the river, all the agriculture, right? All the industry is along the waterway. Uh, it's lined by the railway all the way through Contra Costa County. So here's your water line, here's your railway, right? Um, it has some very underserved areas, uh, very neglected areas, a lot of environmental justice communities. And basically, I always take on the environmental justice communities. Honestly, that's that's my goal is to really bring the environmental justice communities to where they are getting justice, actually, where people are seeing them, where they have a voice. Um, and in some of those communities, it's like we have the Selby slag, which actually leaches out 80 percent of the toxic heavy metals into the bay. Um, I'm working on an alternative community project to the one that um, to the one that they currently are hoping for. That's all I can say about that. Um, so I have a community group that includes scientists that live in the communities that have come together to really write, really write a lot of letters, have a lot of meetings and make a bit of noise and prove that their plan is a better plan. And, you know, it's been a year, they haven't been able to, to continue with their path because of this community group. So, you know, that's pretty amazing and an amazing way to tackle a real issue, I think. Um, and then there's other areas where it's, you know, run off into the streams. We have Marsh Creek out here, which is a very large watershed. You know, you so, see- So, for, so, well, so there's Heidi, so for, many aspects. So yeah. Heidi, for people who aren't, maybe our people are watching this from outside of the area. So we're talking about Contra Costa is in the East Bay, uh, you know, east of San Francisco, yeah. north of Oakland. Yeah. Um, it's a huge part yeah. of where I guess what the Feather River, Consumnes River, some of the rivers that come through that area from the uh, from the snow melt from the Sierras going down towards Yosemite. Yep. So can you can you kind of paint a picture of people of where it's you're Yosemite. located? Okay. And, I am located literally where I am right now and in, in the area that we work on in the Delta is literally where the San, San Joaquin and Sacramento meet. And it, it starts there at the headwater, it goes through the Straits, you have all these areas that come through it, but those are the two main waterways that come through. But we have, I wanna say 25,000 creeks running into our waterways. So we have all these creeks coming down because it's very hilly country. So you've got your top of your watershed, you have rain coming down, melt, all of these different things coming down into all of this already there water. So it's just this very interesting, twisted, uh, meandering, man-made really. But what they've taken is, and it's so funny because I come up to your area, I go to Sacramento and I see, although the, the rivers have been changed, they haven't been changed like ours have been changed. My, mm -hmm. I live on a slough. This slough is a completely man-made waterway taking the Sacramento and San Joaquin. The, the island, I have this small cattle ranch as well on an island, right? Mm -hmm. This island was created literally to keep the salt from coming into the Delta. So you're coming, wow. if, you know, Martinez, Benicia, Vallejo, you're coming with that water, saltier, and it's starting to intrude upon the Delta. Now they have these lovely big pumps that don't do well with the uh, salt water down here. So right. they do things like create an island out of just random stuff, a peat moss island from things they've dragged in from the Delta, put a perimeter of rocks around and filled with soil, right? So I have a little piece of this land. This is uh, an island they actually protect. A lot of islands out here do not get the protection they need. They're, they're poorly built. Um, they were made more for commerce, for housing. So those you see those, if they're not populated or wealthy, as they say, they kind of start to disappear. There's whole islands that are gone and are just like a ring of levee. It's 
quite interesting. We're working wow. on it right now. But my island gets a lot of attention because if that island goes away, the salt comes into the delta and it's a game changer for everybody. So, I right. mean, if you can I, imagine I, that, you know. Yeah, on agriculture, on wildlife, on fish populations. Yeah. And a lot of people, I was fascinated because when we started to learn more about the watershed during our water protector tour, Right. They, there's over 1,100 miles of waterways just in the delta between the Sacramento River, yep. the sloughs, the different side sloughs, the deep water channel, That's which which that. has been an which has been an essential corridor. I mean, going all the way back to the gold rush, it's how people came into San Francisco Bay and up to Sacramento to unload, um, which 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 is fascinating to me. They said there was more people at one point in. Uh, our area of the foothills of the Sierras and Nevada County than actually in San Francisco because of people coming in for the gold rush. Right. So right. it's it's a really send it's, the silt. It's, just send the silt down to my area. <laughs> 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 I see that dirt. That silt is in my my portion of the woods, right? Right. Of the waters, and, you know. And, and of course up here we have a huge issue with um, you know, the, the the toxic legacy of the gold mining that's happened here and a lot of water contamination. Right. Um, we have some issues of uh, lots of runoff yeah. um, from uh, what I would call mismanagement of either agricultural properties, um, but also uh, a lot from, um, I don't want to say names because I know it's you, you walk right. a very sensitive I do. bridge and I, and I want to honor you for being a bridge between policy decision makers and local government and organizations and NGOs and nonprofits and also the community at large and, and how you're helping to bridge that. And I, I, I very much want to, you know, um, emphasize that's what we're trying to do. We're not, we're not about uh, blame. We're about solutions and, and, and about everyone participating, but up here we have a, a, some of those issues, but we also have, you know, our water district sprays 450 miles of canals with Roundup several times a year. And they, they use copper based cutrine in the ditches as an algicide. So, I've actually had several meetings with them to say, like you were just talking about, there's better ways to, um, especially now in this in this modern day of, of creating solutions and and managing uh, water and waterways without adding to the toxicity and the contamination. So it's a huge issue. I mean, all the way up to Mount Shasta, again down into the the Delta, uh, coming up from uh, Feather River, consumeness. That I also know there's a huge issue with climate change and water warming with algae blooms yeah, right now. That's still, yeah, yeah, lots of fish dying up there, yeah. And also what, tulies, right? I know that's yeah. another thing that happens in the Delta, like a lot of the waterways are just getting taken over by a species of plants that aren't necessarily native, yeah, so. invasives, yeah. And in fact, that's like a big, I'm all, that is almost a daily issue for me as a person who owns marinas, who has docks. Um, yeah, the water hyacinth have become a, I mean, it's just overwhelming to see the problem and agree they are using toxic sprays. They are taking boats out, spraying them. I actually did. And you asked me if I had any good videos, if I didn't know we were talking about invasive plants in the Delta. Uh, I actually did on our Facebook, on the RCD Facebook, uh, a couple of years ago for Earth Day, because we couldn't do Earth Day, I did a video about how to remove invasive meat weeds properly from your Delta shoreline. So um, basically the difference is it's a lot of work. You know, I mean, it took, it takes me two weeks. I get out there in shorts wow. and sandals and swimming and I pull instead. Well, it's funny because your initial reaction when you first get here is like, oh, these are amazing plants. You can just push them down right out into somebody else's yard. Right. And you don't think right. about how you just pushed a giant island of invasive weeds literally into your neighbor's yard. So I, I thought about that. I was like, this is not, we shouldn't be doing, it was fun. You know, the first, I did it once and I was right. like, this is not right. You know, and then I walk, I go down the road and here's my neighbor with all my plants. And I thought, no, nah, I'm doing this wrong, this wrong. So I started right. doing, cause I, I had not been working in this area. I just lived out here, right? I work in mm -hmm. kind of more of the creaky situations. So I did a little research and basically um, you pull them out 
you take them away from the water, you put them on the land far enough and they will compost into just wonderful soil and very rapidly because they're mostly water. Um, so it's just another way of it. You know, sometimes it just takes a lot more effort. And I think for me in doing that now, I'm on like year three or four of really removing them and they come back every year. So it's never done. Wow. Right. It, it's back just the same. Every If there is one little bulb somewhere floating in the river, you will have an entire mat of these things, destroying things, really creating algae situations, taking all the oxygen from the fish. You know, everything is just going around. Wow. Right. Um, so my plan now as a human or as a worker, depending on how I have to do that, is to kind of help educate other people that don't that didn't have the information that I do now. And so like doing the videos, showing them how to do it, trying to make it fun. I'm always trying to make everything fun. Like that's my job. Right. Like environmentalism is fun, you know, um, it's a challenge, you know, and it's so funny because like one way to do that is to make them realize that they can pull out weeds from their thing and have a crawdad feast because you get crawdads with your weeds. Give them wow. some recipes about crawdads, you know, because they're invasive crawdads. It's not that big a deal. Uh, it's kind of an interesting twist on how to fix a problem is to, to bring your neighbors in and make it fun, you know? So, so, but with that being said, we have the herbicide problem. And so in my job, I've had this problem with HOAs that are often, you know, the beautiful homes right on the hillside that goes right down to the creek, right? And they want to put a buffer and they want to kill everything. And so I, and it's so funny, sorry, I, my ducks are quacking because it's getting to be nighttime and they're like, yeah, away. I have like 8,000 <laughs> ducks right now. Um, oh my God. Ridiculous! I have mallards. Don't they, don't they get out there and they don't get out there and help you clear clean up the the wow. river and the creek? They they do my creek completely, one hundred percent. My ducks clean all the invasive weeds. So I am one side of my house is the river, then my houses, and then a creek, and that's where like all my critters are. They oh, wow. take care of the entire invasive weed problem in my creek, one hundred percent. No invasive weeds. It used to take me. Uh, hours and hours to pull the weeds out because you turn around and they're back literally you know and here's the issue with these weeds these are fish tank weeds so people are feeling like oh my fish oh i don't want it anymore and we're moving i'm just gonna let him be in the delta oh what a great place for him there goes the plants from and then just boom i mean i'm watching one invasive weed pop up after another and you know as an Aquarius, so it's kind of an interesting thing. So I started in aquariums, right? And now I understand that there needs to be an education level to people buying those plants too, right? Like, it's great you want to have plants, you know, that can survive in the Delta, where normally they wouldn't, they wouldn't make the winter, right? It would get too cold where they're from, they would die back, you would have the small population, they would die back. Here, they don't die back. So we need that education around the pet supply industry, the pond industry. So like, these are all like Heidi's delusions of grandeur now that I haven't really attacked yet. Um, but, you know, I think there's ways, I feel that there, if you provide information that's interesting and it, you go to Petco and you go to the pond stores and you provide right. that information, you go to the HOAs and go, Hey, just let me spend a couple hours talking to your gardeners and giving them an alternative to how to do this. Right. right? All and plant native plants. I will bring kids in. We will dig up all of the things that you're spraying and we will put native plants in and you will not have the problem. Right. Because native plants combat these things that they're trying to combat by getting rid of the invasives. So it's like a weird, um, and, and it sounds like way. and it sounds like a lot of work but i think what's great is like you're talking about your ducks there are some um you know i'm a permaculture designer and we look at how nature is self-organizing and how there's solutions within nature that with human um uh, uh appropriate management and facilitation and having this understanding of how the natural works there are some really simple solutions and uh i mean look what's happening right now with the mismanagement of forest and the horrific amount of wildfires in California. So I think more and more people are seeing, yes. uh, maybe it's harder, you know, looking at a creek or a river and seeing, um, oh, I'm just gonna dump my fish aquarium into the river and seeing the negative yeah. impact. But, but we can start yeah. seeing it with everything of how we've, how we've kind of mismanaged things and our natural world, or our natural resources, how we've mismanaged right. them. And now it's really starting to create 
uh, a lot of problems compounded by other things, whether human created or a natural cycle or a combination of both with climate change and all these things, the wildfires. All I mean, we're not even gonna <sighs> yeah, I mean, we're not even going to talk today um, about, you know, all the uh, the horrific amount of forever chemicals that have been used in fire retardants to put out a lot of the fires. I mean, up, up in the Paradise area, right. it's, it's still even after millions of dollars of remediation and a lot of the waterways and soil, it's still wow. really not a healthy living environment. So I, I That's think- That's my stomping you, ground too. I'm from Chico. So it's so sad. It's sad to know that paradise is uh, poison, you know? Yeah, it's a, well, what a strange. And so, and so on that, Michael, I think, and it's interesting because I felt like um, when I first connected with you and I went to Waterpalooza and I had a great time and we went and toured all the fun sites and I got to see your neck of the woods, um, and, you know, and you're, and I'm looking at, at tribal ancestry and how they've managed the forest. And, you know, whether that was, people like to think, you know, it's, it's because they're amazing and spiritual and all of that is true. Okay. Potentially. But the reality is they tried to understand where they lived because they didn't have all these, the ease of, well, let's just make a thing that does a thing and solves a problem. You actually had to work to make things work. Like you manage the fire because you wanted to weave the baskets, right? You manage the fire because you wanted to protect your village. You manage the fire for food production. They had a base understanding of like, for example, there are plants that need and trees that need fire to regenerate. So those forests want that fire. That's how the, you forget the sweeping, do managed cleaning with fire, the thing <laughs> that should be there, you know, like right. let's get to the bottom of what really works. What look at the natural system and why it works so well without us, you know? And I think yeah. forget. It you know. And you really hit on a node there because there's a whole area now called traditional ecological knowledge based on a lot of indigenous understandings. And I, I actually it. know a few people that are working on some books in Chico about uh, particularly the Maidu. You know, nice. in, in your region, there was a lot of uh, Miwok uh, yep. people up here. We had Nisanan and Maidu. Uh, yep. To the north, you have the, the Winamumwintu and the Klamath tribes. And so it is interesting because now people are starting to say, you know, because even mm. what they realized when, when the colonists came here, that everything wasn't just wild and out of control, that they were actually right. managed in a very high, uh, efficient high and level. conscious way. Yeah. 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 It was a conscious way. Uh, yeah. I started taking these basket weaving classes because I'm trying to actually, uh, I'm trying to retake a beach in Crockett, for, you know, and it was, uh, traditionally it was a wetland. Uh, it had tribal people that were basically slaughtered by the incoming lovely industry that needed the water. It's right there on the Carquina Strait. So as you go into the Bay Area, it's that first bridge you go through. Below it was this wonderful tribe that did all of these great things with the native land, managed the elk. And that, that part of it is killing. I mean, I, people get very weird when I say this, but it's, you can't overpopulate. It's, it's kind of interesting because we're like, we correct one situation. Oh, the elk are back. Oh no, there's too many elk. We need to kill the elk. Like nobody ever does it in a management. Like how, how many cycles, when do we start allowing people to hunt elk? When do we stop? You know, at what months, like they've done it with other seasons, duck season, all these other things, but basically because they saw them going away and they still wanted to shoot my little mallards, which is what you're hearing back there is mallards, you know, but I'm sort of okay. I, at, I'm a Taoist. I don't kill things. I do eat meat. Sorry. I can't help myself. I'm kind of skinny. I would you have to, there's no, no, I can't no handle it. I can't needed. handle it. No okay. excuses so, needed. But the reality is, yeah. And then, but the reality hey, they're, is that they're this cutting point, down the Amazon, they're cutting down the Amazon right now for soy. I mean, you know, it's like, for soy, it? it's never, I know. And then corn for the yeah. renewable energy. I'm just, yeah. like, oh, it's such a, yeah. such a conundrum, you know, it's like, and you know, no more wood because of the pollutant, but then the wood's the really natural thing. Now you have char and biochar. It's like, ah, uh, it just, it's sort of like, 
I don't know. I was sort of feel like I'm climbing this mountain and like getting enough facts to do it right. And just the trick is to reach out to all those people that you know are doing it right, you know, and get these pieces of knowledge, bring them all together, bring the traditional ecology, bring the food that was here. And, and I, I often ask like, what is native now? You know, at what point when you have no more natives, what, when does a non-native become native is invasive about doing something bad and not creating habitat. It's it's ironic here. I'm sorry, now I'm just gonna go tangent. No, I, I, this is all, all right. fascinating questions. Here's, here's tangent -y stuff for me. So behind my house is cattle fields, okay? And they are just grazed cattle, very, it's managed. They manage them in the proper way. There's no runoff. They have livestock ponds. The cattle seem like they almost feel like they're a real herd, you know, but they're being moved around, right? So right. that, so that the land is managed, they don't overgraze because that's the problem. As we shrink all of these things, you can overgraze, you can undergraze, you get rid of all the animals. Now you have wildfire, like the balance is crazy. So I'm sitting in my yard. They have now, so I used to be just like in the middle of farmland, which was sweet, like oh, the middle of farmland with a 40 minute drive to San Francisco to ha have a good time. Like I was, it's heaven, right? So right. now my farmland is slowly just, I mean, I'm still on this old country road. Nobody, everybody's scared of levees. So they'd hardly drive out here, thank heavens. Um, but like the main road, which was all farms when I bought this is now houses. 2,600 houses are going in behind my little farm home, okay? But because it's, I know, 26, I mean, it's wow. just outrageous. But because it was a wetland, which, eh, you know, eh, grazed cattle, not, not managed wetland by any means, cattle managed, they had to do 300 acres of wetland behind me. So now my house is like in this protected zone of wetland, which is very cool. But not two days before the bulldozers came. So you think of managed wetland, oh, a wetland's going in. You don't think of bulldozers and diggers. And, and all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, those little coyotes live in that bush over there. Like, I'm like, oh Lord, like I right. know the fox house. I saved that egret that lives in that tree. And it, all of a sudden I was like horrified, like, oh my God, stop making wetlands. It's a, it's a habitat. It's a habitat. And so like now I'm just harassing the guys behind me really to tell you the truth. Like I'm just like out there going, could you just leave that one bush, please? Because there's like critters in it. And it's kind of this interesting push where like all of the critters have adapted to this new kind of environment that's been created by farm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have your coyotes. These are all native little foxes. Uh, I have little beautiful minks that live out there. I've been watching them. You know, my birds live out there. The invasive blackberries provide food, right? All of a sudden I went from being super stoked about this new wetland to like, oh my, I have to protect all my critters. And it, it's kind of mind boggling that I still haven't come to like, other than I'm just like, basically will tie myself to a bush if I have to, to save this little coyote that will, in <laughs> fact, that will in fact probably eat my ducks. Okay, so there's the, all of these things are such a weird circle that almost even when you get to the level where like, say people like us, where we're talking to so many people and we're getting input, like even that is like, is this, good is what I do always good right is every project is native good you know it's such a strange sorry just to make everybody have to talk about really big weird stuff but like it's an evaluation I mean and you know and I love my delta but like what it's rocks you know I have rocks for a river you have trees right that's nice you know you look over at your false bank and it's got still has plants mine's rocks but i love it not that i want the rocks but whatever you know it's kind of interesting you know yeah so absolutely. Sorry. sorry to do that to you. oh no it's so. all it's all important okay. stuff and also the whole idea of innovation that you know we have to look back at traditional knowledge find what works things are different now the environment's yeah. different uh, seasonal uh changes are everything is you know evolving and changing so we have to you know stay open to like looking at these things. But I think what I really appreciate about you is that, you know, you understand uh, the science of these things, but you're also a deep thinker and you're a very human, human being with lots of compassion. And, and, you, and there's a lot of other stuff that I know you do where we won't get in the call. And yeah, I, do crazy and stuff. I do so much crazy stuff. <laughs> and also very, <laughs> very important is I'm working with technology. 
Like at this point, I'm going, we have all these tech kids, we have all these people doing all these things, but they're not coming to the environmental realm, right? So like, how do you get your drones to do water quality dipping for you? So you have accurate water quality quickly. How do you create a weird machine that'll compost these Delta plants, these invasive weeds into something usable? And so I'm doing things like hackathons and six week, just like get all the tech folks together and mostly not pay them. I mean, I'm sorry, but <laughs> like mostly just get them involved in it, get their project out there you know, let them showcase what they do with a government agency, which is never like these things are not a, these are not generally a fit. You've got, you know, you've got the, the Bitcoin folks that are really tech savvy and very green, honestly, quite a bit of green right. going on in the community, but with their dislike of government, like I'm that we're that facilitator because we're non-regulatory. So I think I think that will be future wise, like for people like you and me, if we want to make a change, we actually sort of have to make a full change, like change both sides of the minds, right? Oh Absolutely. God. Everyone has to come to the table to, to think tank and discourse because because the problems right. that are happening, whether you're a billionaire living in a house in, yeah. in uh, San Francisco or you're yeah. living uh, along the banks of the river in a, in a, in a homeless area or your, right. you know, basically your income and your location now really don't uh, keep you safe from all the incredible changes and issues that we're having. So it, it really takes everyone coming to the table and implementing solutions. I just did a whole interview with someone in Sacramento who was talking about, you know, just this, the sad situation of homelessness. Uh, right. And, and actually we, we went through a whole series of videos and photos of the incredible amount of, of uh, the lack of sanitation and trash. And I'm, I'm not trying to demonize or blame yeah. the homeless for the situation that they're in, but just the incredible amount of- Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. Impact that that's having an environment, but why is there no political will to protect the natural world, the environment, or to even, I mean, talking space. about helping the people is a whole other political oh, discourse, oh. but. Well, interesting, <laughs> some towns are doing that though. Some towns are able to do that. There's there's a small town in called Martinez that's in the Alhambra watershed that I had been a watershed coordinator for. Mm. And their city council has set up a space that's safe for everybody provided the proper tents. And so it's still an encampment, but what it has is garbage. It has managed uh, showers. So it's not like open game and everybody can just willy nilly use it whenever right. and nobody's there to clean it. They have worked with community groups, with churches, my ducks are about to go off because they're about to be put to bed. Mom, um, mom, get over here. Uh, come put me in. And, and they have really made it so that the people have been brought up Okay, the garbage is collected. So here's the problem I have. I'm a creek cleaner. I do these creek cleanups. I have coastal cleanup day. We take tons and tons of trash throughout country, just our little neck of the woods, right? With Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and anybody I can get out there, right? Anyone I can give a free piece of pizza to that'll come help me, right. um, you know? And, and that's hard. It's hard to gather all those people. I now am looking at places that these kids really have managed with me for 14 years now are just piled with garbage because where do you live when you don't have access to water? You live on a Creek, right? Because that's your access to the water. So I understand why they're there. I understand the need for the water. I don't understand. What I don't understand is when I, when I personally wish to go communicate with the people in that community, the, the homeless community and say, hey, how can I help you? Everybody's so afraid of me doing that, I, but I am not afraid of doing that. And if we don't make that change where cities and counties go, we need to actually provide some kind of service to make this not awful because at, people are, will start screaming about tax dollars. Let me tell you about the tax dollars at the end of this cycle of mess sure. where I can't clean this stuff up, right? Sure. And I keep warning, like the clean water program, I'm like, we need to really keep a grip on this and start thinking about providing dumpsters, start thinking about providing porta potties because we provide them for everything else. You know, Caltrans has porta potties. They make a huge mess. I clean up their stuff too, to be honest. You know, like let, let's all get together 
maybe we can't figure out how to get them money or a job, but we can provide some things, some services enough that, that they have hope, right? And that they're not living in their own garbage. They're not having rocks thrown at them by the neighbors. You know, it's just like a- Right. It's gonna can, be the can, biggest- Can you hear me okay? Uh-huh, I can. Can you hear me? All I can hear is my ducks now. Oh, now I can kind of hear you. You got me? Uh, can you hear me okay? I can now. I think you're in and out. I'm not sure if it's me or you. It's probably me. I don't know if you guys can hear me. I think Michael's frozen. Frozen in dime. Can you hear me now? I feel like I have to do a song and dance or something now. I, it's always annoying when just when you're getting to the meat of it, <laughs> literally. But I, I will say this, I can hear you. I had this image of your ducks in back chewing your <laughs> Wi-Fi connection being like, mom, get out here. Yeah, they probably us. are. They're, they're probably cutting the line right now, to be honest with you. <laughs> so I, I, will, I will say this. Yeah. Oh, I hear them. Yeah. Uh, well, our, I think our next talk, we're going to talk about bringing the hippos in, cleaning yeah, up the right. hyacinth. <laughs> right. You have yeah. no idea. I would, that I'll be up there riding the hippos, right? <laughs> hey. Hey. Um, Stranger things have brought people to do good stuff. Let me tell you. I know. I know. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, next so time I, I'll have materials. Next time I'll have some stuff for you for your audience. Yeah. To help. Yeah. And I and I will say this. This is a, a brief introduction as we still yeah. get to know each other. I'm really excited about uh, collaborating about water, especially mm -hmm. being in neighboring watersheds, but be, very much being cut from the same cloth. And um, yeah. I know Bob was hoping to be on the call, and uh, he wasn't able to. There's this is so much happening right now. A, a transformer in Sacramento in the last couple of days, like blew up and a lot of people lost mm -hmm. power and there's been into in, 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 uh, issues with connectivity up here. We okay. just had um, 8,000 people with no power in Nevada City oh, for wow. days because the storms, so cold. not to mention everything wow. else. So um, I'm glad that we can uh, have this time together to kind of have a chat. I mean, it's such a, a, a deep, excuse the pun, it's such a deep water well to go into about talking about mm -hmm. these issues, but even more importantly than just talking about issues is talking about solutions and things that not only you're doing and, and, and I'm trying to do, but what people can do. And we talked about environmental toxins, things that people do, you know, our, our, our cosmetic products that are toxic, that have an impact on our health, our household cleaning products that are toxic, how we do our landscaping. I know California is passing an anti- gas powered power tool legislation soon to try you know and then we can think about well, our landscaping and then hey I, i've done my part maybe i could be a, a water advocate not just here at my residence maybe i can do stuff in the community there you go to help clean up water because you know water is life and clean water is the key to uh, our yeah. community health so yeah. i want to thank you for your time and the incredible yeah. work that you're doing uh you for 15 years now I know. <sighs> <laughs> all my and, life uh, it'll be all my life for sure so you know. so is there is there a website people could go and check out more about what, uh, what your work and what you do and i'm really looking yeah. forward to um potentially collaborating on water palooza i think uh yeah. i just met kim kim from the consumnist tribe who's doing a lot of great water stuff and i've met with uh, uh marge grove from the miwok tribe and also melissa tayaba so I'm thinking this year, instead of running around and trying to show off all the amazing pearls of the Delta, like really right. doing a more three day intensive drop in around education, uh -huh. advocacy and activism Good. Um, Good. And, and, and doing it the weekend after Memorial Day. And what's nice, we have to support the chamber. So anyway, I'm looking forward to hey. uh, more synergy and collaboration yeah. because it really takes everybody to deal with these issues. It can't it can't be one person. Um, you know, shouldering the brunt of responsibility, but you do more than your share. And we want to, we want to thank you and honor you at this time for all the work that you do, Heidi. Thank you. Thank and Michael. I am so glad that I've met you. I feel like, uh, yeah, things will move forward and uh, it's bright. I, I feel like people need to remember the future can actually be bright. It doesn't have to be all doom and gloom, you know? And I think it's, uh, it's groups like yours that come together out of love that change things in general, right? So 
Thank you. Absolutely. And All thank right, you. well, have a great yeah. night. Yeah. And tell yeah. the ducks, tell <laughs> the ducks, tell the ducks we said hello and thank you for their understanding and patience. <laughs> All right. I'll see you guys later. Hey, oh, we're signing universe. out. Thanks for watching. Solutionaires, everyone here as part of Earthstock Enterprises with Heidi Petty. And uh, have a great holiday and new year. And we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks. Bye.